Hello, my name is Tony. Alfred Joseph Hitchcock compiled and edited the entire dictionary for much of the language of the cinema. It is impossible to overstate just what a definitive influence he had during his career, the impact of his legacy, and the debt owed to him by just about every filmmaker on the planet. He was an originator in every sense of the word. Even his lesser works possess elements of such genius inherent within them that they have often been imitated but never fully equaled. Without him, modern cinema as we know it would not have existed. Known as the master of suspense, he defined the concept in simple terms as being when the audience suspects, sees, or knows what is happening, but the character or characters on screen do not. One of the classic and off-sighted examples of this is a scene in The Birds. Tippy Hedron sits on a bench outside a school and lights a cigarette. Behind her is a climbing frame. As she smokes, a bird lands on the frame. Then another then another, which is joined by another. All the time she is oblivious, whilst the audience is aware of exactly what is transpiring, until the climbing frame is bristling with birds. Eventually, of course, she turns and sees what is going on, but all the time Hitchcock cranks up the tension incrementally to near breaking point. Sure, it's the old traditional pantomime behind you routine, but the construction and composition of the sequence is so clever, calculated and precise, the audience almost holds its breath throughout. That's genius, that is. The modern action thriller was created by Hitchcock in terms of directorial style and content. He was fond of his tropes and recurrent themes, especially the one wherein an innocent is accused of being a wrongdoer and has to clear his name. The 39 Steps, Saboteur, North by Northwest. He liked the notion of characters wrestling with damaged obsessive and phobic psychology. Stage fright, rear window, vertigo. He liked black humour. Psycho being the blackest black comedy ever made, folks. He had a thing for blondes, especially those befitting the Raymond Chandler description, a blonde enough to make a bishop kick in a stained glass window. He liked to manipulate the emotions of the viewer, often implicating them in supporting the questionable behaviours of his characters, switching their loyalties from character to character at will, puppeteering their emotional responses, as in Psycho, Strangers on a Train, Marnie, and indeed the subject of this review, Frenzy. He was a natural craftsman, an instinctive visionary, a creative luminary with a unique understanding of just what and how a visually captured moment would impact on an audience. There was only one of him, and there will never be another. Should anyone doubt his credentials, here's an ad hoc yet tragically incomplete list of examples of the genres he engineered and by the same token defined. The modern action thriller with The Man Who Knew Too Much and North by Northwest. The slasher movie with Psycho. The psychological thriller with Rear Window, Vertigo, Dial M for Murder, Strangers on a Train, and Marnie. The eco-horror with The Birds. The serial killer flick with The Lodger and Shadow of a Doubt. The courtroom drama with The Paradigm Case. The gothic gripper with Rebecca and Jamaica Inn. He unfailingly constructed and reconstructed celluloid templates for so many types of movies, it's almost unimaginable, yet gloriously true. Okay, so modern thinkers, or non-thinkers, may well castigate him for what they perceive as peddling misogyny, sexism, sexual sadism, voyeurism, and other isms that pop into their vacant skulls at random. But true genius transcends such petty foibles and superficial brickbats. At his best, he was so good that criticism becomes redundant. Even at his most lacklustre, he was still ahead of most others' best efforts, and therefore the same applies. Even a slab of mostly lumbering boredom like Topaz has enough good stuff in it to be able to piss gasoline down the neck of anything by Christopher Nolan and set it on fire. Now it may come as something of a surprise, but I do occasionally think about what I'm doing, not often or very much, I grant you, but I do give it some thought sometimes, for a bit. So it was during one of these reflective moments I realised that everything I've ever seen by Hitchcock has been on TV, a medium that he described as bubblegum for the eyes. Apart from one key film I saw in the Market Hall cinema back in the early 70s, and that was his penultimate venture, Frenzy. And wouldn't you know it, despite a lukewarm reception from critics at the time of release, and audiences not exactly forming a stampede to buy tickets, it just so happens to be my favourite Hitchcock movie. And despite the instant knee-jerk derision that may well be headed my way as a result, I'm going to tell you why. Unless, of course, you don't want to know. In which case, you can kindly switch off and piss off. In that order. Because should you do it the other way round and piss off first, this will stay on after you've pissed off, even though you won't be there to hear or see it. And that's pointless. That aside, if you do want to hear me out, I'm more than happy to have you on board, Pilgrim, so let's go do it. 
With Frenzy, Hitch returned to his native London. In fact, the location with which his greengrocer parents would have had connections, Covent Garden Market. The film is based on the 1966 novel Goodbye Piccadilly, Farewell Leicester Square by Arthur Laburn. Hitchcock got playwright Anthony Schaefer, author of the hit stage play Sleuth, to adapt it for the screen, which might explain why some of the interior scenes feel a bit stagey and claustrophobic. Later, Schaefer would script the truly amazing and peerless folk horror trailblazer The Wicker Man. And if you ain't seen that, your education in British cinema has a hole in it deeper than Cheddar Gorge and wider than the crack in Godzilla's butt. Controversially, the prolific and highly talented Henry Mancini completed a score for the film, but Hitchcock decided he didn't like it. Shut the fuck up! So without further ado, it got scrapped, and instead Ron Goodwin, whose achievements included Were Eagles Day and the Battle of Britain, was wheeled in to compose an alternative, which Hitch must have liked better because that's what he used. Gilbert Taylor handled the cinematography, and it was rumoured that Hitchcock solicited the input of Leonard J. South, who had been a camera operator on Psycho and Marnie to lend an uncredited helping hand with the visuals. The plotline uses a frequent Hitchcockian narrative device, the wrongly accused protagonist fighting against the odds to prove his innocence. Daringly makes both the hero and villain vary in shades of dislikable, and from the outset starts to tamper with the audience's loyalties and sympathies between the two. This is what happens. Richard Blaney, John Finch, is an ex-RAF squadron leader working as a bartender in a pub near Covent Garden. A brusque, swaggering womanizer with a fondness for alcohol and a habit of helping himself to spirits from the optics. He's tickling the fancy of barmaid and co-worker Barbara Babs Milligan, Anna Massey. His ex-wife, Brenda, Barbara Lee Hunt, owns a successful dating agency nearby. The landlord of the pub where he works, Felix Forsyth, Bernard Cribbins, barely disguises the fact he hates Blaney and fancies his chances with Babs. So he uses Blaney's freeloading of booze from the pub as a reason to sack him. Quite apart from the fact half the time he's pulling your tits instead of pulling pints. Now look here. He can't keep his hands off you. The customers are always talking about it. And what about you? Always fingering me? Fingering? Does that mean what I think it means in the traditional sense? I do hope so. Homeless and broke, he bemoans his lot to his friend Bob Rusk, Barry Foster, who runs a fruit stall on the market. Rusk gives him a hot tip for a horse race, but Blaney has no money to bet. Deciding to tap up his ex-wife for some cash, he visits the dating agency where they argue, overheard by secretary Monica, Jean Marsh. Brenda offers to take Blaney out for dinner at her club, where Blaney becomes belligerent and argumentative again in front of witnesses. However, things calm down and they part amicably enough. The next day, Rusk turns up at the dating agency where it transpires he has been rejected as a client due to his weird and unsavoury sexual proclivities. This is in the days before Tinder, when such things were not considered positive qualities for relationship building. He proceeds to rape and murder Brenda, strangling her with his necktie. Rusk is therefore revealed as the local serial killer the newspapers are calling the necktie murderer, the one who killed the naked woman who washed up on the Thames embankment at the start of the film with a tie around her neck. Sorry, did I not mention that? I say, it's not my club tie, is it? Yeah, perish the thought, your lordship. Anything but that. Blaney returns to the dating agency to find Brenda's office locked. He leaves again, seen by Monica, who is returning from a lunch break. When Brenda's body is discovered, Blaney is firmly in the frame as the perpetrator of the necktie murders. He goes on the run, assisted by Babs. An old friend, Johnny Clive Swift, runs into Blaney and Babs and offers to let him stay at his apartment. Johnny's wife, Hetty, Billy Whitelaw, is less than pleased, as she despises Blaney. Babs returns to Covent Garden to collect her belongings, and Forsyth informs her he's contacted the police and they want to interview her. Rusk overhears and intervenes, telling Babs she can hole up at his place. Once there, her fate is sealed. Blaney in the frame for Babs' murder and with no alibi as Johnny and Hetty refuse to help him for fear of prosecution for harbouring a criminal, turns to Rusk. Rusk puts him up in his flat but immediately shops him to the police, which arouses Blaney's suspicions that Rusk is in fact the killer. How, with all the evidence stacked against him, can Blaney prove his innocence? Tricky, yeah? Frenzy is a prime example of Hitchcock having great fun with some groovy, macabre events, jet-black gallows humour, and masterful pushing of the audience's buttons. 
He gives us a hero who is not a particularly nice guy, an arrogant, self-pitying, down-on-his-luck chancer with a short fuse. The villain is even more repellent. On the surface, all salt of the earth, laddish, cockney charm and cheery goodwill, looking out for his dear old mum and whatnot. But underneath, there festers a seething mass of sexual sadism and perverted desires. John Finch is a worthy choice for the role of Blaney, an egocentric military snob used to giving orders but less happy about taking them, a supercilious man with a drink problem and no real skill set suited to civilian life. Barry Foster is creepily effective in the role originally offered to Michael Caine. He turned it down, and not a lot of people know that and manages, despite playing a wholly despicable and unsympathetic monster, to invest Rusk with some small level of identifiable humanity. And wouldn't you know it, Hitchcock is going to convince you to root for him at one key point in the narrative. You'll know you shouldn't, you won't want to, but you will all the same. So why is Frenzy my personal favourite Alfred Hitchcock movie when there are over 50 to choose from? What makes it so special? A standout? Well, for a start, it's the first and only Hitchcock movie I've seen on the big screen. It gets nostalgia points for that. Also, it was a return to form for the old master, who kicked off the 60s in crowning fashion with Psycho and the Birds, then stuttered a little with Marnie, and dragged his heels badly with two would-be high-concept espionage thrillers, Torn Curtain and Topaz, that were both, well, underwhelming. Don't get me wrong, they weren't appalling stinkers by any stretch, but for a man who had set the bar so high, they seemed to represent something of a decline. Hitchcock was no longer meeting his own high standards, but Frenzy, now that was much more like it. I don't know if he initially planned it as his last film, there would be one more family plot in 1976, but his return to London felt like a coming home and laying to rest. Covent Garden was winding down, its future as a going concern uncertain, the old commerce slowly ebbing away, and with it a certain type of culture, people and way of life. Hitchcock sought to capture it before it was gone, and he does so with genuine sincerity, filling the screen with a feeling and atmosphere specific to a time and place that would soon be no more. The marketplace and surrounding area fizzes with a careworn vibrancy, providing a unique sensory hit of London in the early 70s, drab and diminishing, yet somehow still alive with the DNA of history and a down-at-heel splendour in its blood. It's an experience. Some high-profile stars turned down the chance to work with Hitchcock on Frenzy. The aforementioned Michael Caine, Laurence Olivier, Helen Mirren, Vanessa Redgrave and Eileen Atkins. Well, they are lost the Philistines. The lack of any obvious glamour puss profiles amongst the actors and actresses works in the film's favour. The characters more resemble real people. Not that they are visually unattractive, just not your usual pin-up superstars. No Cary Grants or Grace Kelly's here. The film has a more authentic kitchen sink look and feel about it grounded and down to earth. There isn't any Hollywood soft focus or airbrushing, which makes it a more plausible proposition, to my eyes at any rate. There are some wickedly provocative and deliberately disturbing moments, including one of the most distressing and perverse murders ever filmed. When Rusk murders Brenda, he rips open her blouse, exposing her breasts, rapes her and chants, lovely, over and over, each intonation of the word growing tonally deeper, louder, harsher, more well, frenzied. Then he strangles her with his necktie. Though not explicit apart from the naked breast shots, and although little is shown in graphic terms, it is an emotionally unnerving sequence. Only Hitchcock's skilled direction pulls it back from the brink of exploitation. The final shot of Brenda's face, eyes wide, swollen tongue lolling from her mouth, leaves a lasting mental imprint of the degrading aftermath of a fatally violent sexual murder. After killing Babs and landing Blaney with the blame, you know, I think John Finch's character was called Blamey in the novel. No, seriously, that was his name, I think. Dick Blamey. Anyway, after killing Babs, Rusk puts her body in a potato sack and dumps it on the back of a potato delivery lorry heading to God knows where. Later, he notices his tie pin is missing and figures that Babs had grabbed it when he was killing her. Desperate to get it back, he climbs into the rear of the potato truck under the tarpaulin. At this point, the truck pulls off and heads down the highway. To make matters worse, when he locates Babs' corpse, he finds rigor mortis has set in. Time for a protracted and increasingly stress-inducing ride as Rusk wrestles with the body getting slapped in the face by an uncooperative foot and having to break her fingers one by one to release her hold on the pin. It is painfully grueling, sweaty, nerve-jangling stuff and the point at which ace manipulator Hitchcock places the viewer right in the truck with Rusk. And despite knowing he is a monster, an evil murderer and perverted nut bar, the result is you want him to succeed and get away with it. It is a consummate masterclass of black comedy, vice-like tension and breath-baiting suspense. To add an even more grisly 
grisly layer, because that isn't quite enough, the corpse eventually spills out onto the motorway along with a shower of errant potatoes. The audience breathes a collective sigh of relief when Rusk makes it to the safety of a roadside cafe conspicuously covered in potato dust, when of course we should really want him to get caught. The performances from the supporting cast are uniformly proficient with some playing against type. Bernard Cribbins was a jovial comedy actor, natural habitat being carry-on films, Peter Sellers flicks, and family-friendly fairs such as The Railway Children. Curie is especially convincing as the nasty piece of work pub landlord Forsyth. The women, Anna Massey, Barbara Lee Hunt, Billy Whitelaw, and Jean Marsh, are atypically attractive rather than Hollywood beautiful, and as such assimilate as flesh-and-blood characters with the environments they inhabit. None of them treated very well, either getting murdered or stereotypically portrayed as frigid, repressed, confrontational, but the males don't come out of it any better. They're mostly sexist, self-satisfied, obnoxious misogynists, and about as desirable as acne. Light relief comes in the form of the investigating officer's wife, Vivian Merchant. Inspector Oxford, Alex McGowan, is routinely traumatised by her cooking. She's as daft as a day-glow dildo, and taking lessons on cordon bleu cookery. She prepares repulsive and inedible dishes that are Oxford feels duty-bound to pretend he likes. She gets her comeuppance when she drinks one of her cocktail concoctions and has to run off to be sick. It's not exactly trouser burst in hilarity, but it lightens the tone, and she does demonstrate some insight with the belief that Blaney has been wrongfully convicted. She may be a complete fucking idiot, but she's right. I can sympathise with that. Talking of Blaney, his subsequent escape from the prison hospital is a mildly preposterous and mechanical contrivance to bring the whole thing to a conclusion, but it works on its own terms, I guess. And in a nod to Rope, Hitchcock's 1948 masterwork, a trunk and a dead body figure significantly in the final scenes of the film. Frenzy is the sort of movie you can either rail against for its dubious treatment of women, its disturbing attitudes to sexuality, its seeming delighted perversity, and its deliberately upsetting set pieces. Or you can get on board with it and enjoy it as a wickedly provocative black joke and indulge yourself in the sheer dazzling artistry of the cinematic craftwork at play. Some great trademark Hitchcock tracking shots and daringly edited camera work embellish the overall design. It provides several amusing verbal tripwires inserted here and there, designed purely to provoke a reaction with their jaw-dropping content. I don't think such dialogue was intended as a celebration of male insensitivity and sexist piggery as such, more Hitchcock being mockingly critical and poking fun at the absurdity of the male psyche and ego. The conversation between the doctor and the lawyer in the pub where Blaney is drinking being a prime example. He rapes them first, doesn't he? Yes, I believe he does. Oh, well, I suppose it's nice to know that every cloud has a silver lining. <laughs> Every cloud has a silver lining. Yeah, well, at least you get a forcible pork in before being throttled to death. What more could a girl want on a night out? The high priests and priestesses of the liberal elite of today would certainly blow a fuse over that one, if they were dumb enough to take it seriously and not recognise when someone, namely Mr. A.J. Hitchcock, is just yanking their chain. What am I talking about if they're dumb enough? Jesus H. Christ, of course they fucking are. Despite the shabby realism of the locations and the more low-key and deglamorized backdrops and cast, Frenzy, like Psycho before it, is something Hitchcock conceived of and intended as a very dark melodrama shot through with delicious and malicious veins of black comedy and gallows humour. It's a fairground ride that isn't intended to be taken even remotely seriously, a thriller expressly designed to thrill and to entertain, and a love letter to a London that was dissolving into the past. As such, in my opinion, it's a result in success, one of his best works, and my favourite Hitchcock movie, one to savour. In fact, it's... Lovely! I really do mean it when I say grateful thanks for your time and attention. Lately, I've received a lot of kind, if thoroughly undeserved, comments from subscribers and casual visitors to the channel, and it's been pleasantly surprising. You may not believe it, but I swear it's true. I'm equally as happy to get comments from those with opposing opinions to mine, or those who disagree with me, and point out my many factual errors. Well, almost anyway. Thanks for your support, whatever the deal. I will be coming around again. Threat of the month. Meanwhile, here's a song called Pretend. Snowflakes 
leaves are falling and they make me shiver Emotions I can't keep at bay Life softly spilling from your apartment Golden squares cast on the snow Stamping my feet as I watch with enchantment You shine with an absolute glow Just pretend You turn off the lamp And retire into darkness I wait until daylight comes This lonely vigil I know that it's pointless I'm stood here all frozen and numb You know my friend just pretend it should be the end, but I just pretend. Only way that I can find to feel this close to you. It's unreal, but I don't mind. What else can I do? Notice, and that's not surprising There's someone to watch over you When you go to bed To the point of arising I'm dreaming along with you too You know, my friend I just pretend it's not the end, for I just pretend You know, my friend, I won't let it end It's not the end, for I just pretend